Hello, I'm Midge Rendell. I'm the chairman of the Rendell Center for Civics and Civic Engagement, and I also happen to be a judge. I was a trial court judge, but currently I am an appellate judge. I am on the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit based in Philadelphia. And we hear appeals from all of the trial courts in Pennsylvania, Delaware, New Jersey, and the Virgin Islands. Well, what does that mean? Well, in our trial courts, and what you see on television is usually the trial courts, they have cases where uh, the juries hear witnesses uh, and the cases are decided. And it's usually the lawyers who are asking questions, but there are real people in the courtroom, the witnesses, the parties and jurors. Well, if the person does not like what happened in the trial court, let's say a defendant is convicted and found guilty and wants to file an appeal, that comes to my court. And when you take an appeal, their lawyer just has to find and file a notice of appeal that says we're appealing from the district court's order of a certain date, or maybe several of the orders. And they don't have to write up front say why, but then the lawyers will come together and put together briefs. We call them briefs. They're basically uh, memoranda. They can be 40 pages long saying why they think the trial court erred, what went wrong in the trial court. And maybe they want to say that, well, there were 20 things that were wrong. But when they file a brief in the appellate court and they pick the issues they want to raise, they probably keep it to maybe three or five or at most eight issues. The key ones that they think really have a chance of getting the lower court ruling to be reversed. So when it's a criminal defendant whose lawyer is urging for reversal, they might want to say, well, there was evidence that was admitted that was prejudicial and improperly admitted, which should cause you to grant a new trial to the defendant. Well, that's a good argument because then you get an entirely new trial. Or maybe it was that the jury was improperly instructed on the law. So they decided the case and the defendant's guilt based upon an erroneous instruction. Well, that's a good reason to give a new trial. So when someone is arguing to reverse what happened in the trial court, they want to find something that's very basic that, so that the case should be redone and the defendant will have another chance to stand trial. And usually they raise just a few issues and will want to come up with the ones that they might think are the most appealing to the Court of Appeals. And usually it will be something where the district court got the law wrong. If the district court got the law wrong, then it's really going to have to go back. If it's a matter of evidence that was presented that shouldn't have been, well, but maybe there was other evidence that was so overwhelming of this defendant's guilt that on balance, we don't think a new trial needs to be granted. So the appellate lawyer who's representing the defendant in a criminal case who was convicted, or in a civil case, the party who lost, wants to find some way to say this needs to be redone, this needs to be reversed and go back. Most of our cases which come to our court end up being affirmed. That means the trial court did a good job and over 90% of the cases we get are affirmed, meaning we can't find anything that was really wrong so that a new trial should be warranted. And why is that? Well, we have a lot of very good federal trial judges. They're very careful, they're very experienced, and they, they do the right thing. Sometimes they don't, or sometimes the law has changed. Sometimes it might be a policy ruling. So we will get these briefs that are filed by the lawyers, the appellant arguing this needs to go back and be reversed. The appellee, the lawyer, will be arguing the trial court got it right. Or if they got some things wrong, still there's no reversible error. It may have been not that relevant, not that meaningful in the scheme of things, so you should affirm. So we get these papers, they're called the briefs. The appellant file, files their brief raising their issues. The appellee files their brief saying everything was 
perfect. Or if not perfect, there's no reversible error. And then the appellant gets to file a reply that replies to what the other party said. So we have basically three briefs filed before us. And we look at the briefs and we have the assistance of law clerks. Most appellate judges have maybe three, maybe four law clerks because all of these briefs will cite precedent. They will cite cases. And the appellant will say, the court failed to go by this precedent and this is controlling. And the other side, the appellee will say, no, that case is distinguishable. Well, if I'm sitting with 40 page briefs citing all these cases, there can be 30, 40 cases that are cited in these briefs and referred to. I need law clerks to help me say who's right, who's wrong, give me copies of the cases, help me with what we call a bench memo. So we look at the briefs and we decide whether we need to hear the lawyers argue before us. And very often the appellate courts, I'd say universally, they sit in panels, panels of three, panels of five, some appellate courts sit with the entire court sitting. But in the federal system, we have pretty large courts and we usually sit in panels of three judges who are appointed randomly to hear these cases. So the three judges, myself and two other judges, we get the briefs, we help have our arguments uh, before us, we have the law clerks helping us, and we decide whether we need to hear argument. Sometimes, it's so clear that the trial court got it right, that we really don't need to hear argument. It would kind of be a waste of time, and we'd probably be berating the, uh, the uh, appellee with why they got it wrong in the trial court. Because sometimes what happens in the appellate court is that the things that they are raising before us, they never preserved in the trial court. That is, some evidence was admitted, and no one ever objected to it and an instruction was given by the judge to the jury, and no one objected to that obstruction instruction. Well, if that's the case, then when we review it, we review it for what's called plain error, which is a pretty high standard. So there's a lot that goes on in the trial court that's going to dictate how it goes in the Court of Appeals. Because if the lawyer was asleep and didn't really object to the to the evidence or object on the wrong ground or didn't raise a certain thing, we're not going to judge it. Uh, we're not going to reverse based on that unless it was really, really egregious and we think that a real wrong has been done because the error was so plain. But it's a very high standard. So what happens in the trial court, whether something is what we call preserved, dictates a lot what happens in the appellate court. So let's say we're gonna hear argument. Why would we hear argument in a case? Well, maybe we think that the district court got it wrong. Maybe it's a complicated criminal case where the law is complex and we're just not sure and we wanna hear it because it's a very serious crime. Um, so we have a lot of reasons. Sometimes there might be policy reasons where we think we need to, to look at the law again Maybe we think the precedent is wrong. Maybe we think something needs to be done with the precedent. Well, I will note that in a three judge panel, if we think the precedent is wrong, we unfortunately cannot change it. Only if the court sits and bank, which in our case is all 14 judges, can we change our precedent. And of course we can't change the precedent of the Supreme Court, only it can do that. But let's say we have a case where a certain rule has been applied and we're thinking, you know, we don't think that that's the right rule. We still in our panel need to apply that rule, but maybe there is a, a concurrence or another opinion written saying, maybe we should take a look at this. And once we have issued our ruling, the parties then can ask for rehearing by the full court to change that precedent and undo it. So there can be reasons that we hear a case that are different from, well, did the district court get it wrong? So we hear argument in a case, three judges sitting in the court, and the lawyers will come before us and argue, we'll usually give 15 or 20 minutes aside, and they have to be pretty specific as to what they want to argue, because they only have a limited time, uh, but we will have studied the case. 
we will have studied the various sides, the cases they've cited, and very often we, we are arguing at a very high level. Uh, and I'll never forget when I used to go to the Supreme Court when I was in first year law school at Georgetown, I would go listen to argument and I would have looked at what the case was about. And I would hear the argument and I would have no idea what they were talking about because it was at such a high level of precision. They had drilled down on the cases so far that they were arguing about a certain phrase that they thought was interesting that maybe hadn't been the focus of the briefs, but the justices and sitting around with their law clerks found that this was you know, a key issue and something they were gonna decide. So very often we get to such a level of precision and specificity in these arguments that it becomes difficult for a lay person to really follow what's going on. So the lawyers argue, that's what we call it. They argue, they're urging a certain side to us. The appellant will say, this was wrong, or this is why you should change this. This is why you should send it back. And the appellee will say, everything was fine. Uh, one of the best arguments that an appellee ever made before a panel was that although it was a six week trial during which the district court didn't, uh, didn't commit any errors, the errors were so minuscule that there was no abuse of discretion and we should affirm. And that was a perfect argument. And he was absolutely right. Now, of course, the appellant had something to say in response to that because there is time for a rebuttal by the appellant, maybe five minutes or three minutes just to say that that, that was wrong. But uh, we will have to decide the cases based upon, well, our Laurel clerks will have prepared what we call bench memoranda. It goes through all the cases and the analysis. And in my court, we don't exchange memoranda ahead of time. I will have my bench memo and we will have pretty much decided where I think it should come out. Others may have had different viewpoints based upon different research or just a different view. So sometimes during the argument from the questions of the other judges, you can figure out whether everybody's on the same wavelength or not. Uh, and then after the, the, the lawyers have argued, we thank them and we confer on the case. The judges will retire to a conference room and we'll tell our reasons as to why we think that the case should be affirmed or reversed or whether it needs to be remanded for something else to be, to be done in the district court. Uh, and in my court, the senior judges go first in explaining their reasoning. And since I'm a senior judge, very often I go first, which I really like, because I can lay out all my reasons as to why I think the case should be decided the way I think it should. Uh, and then the other judges decide. And it could be we agree uh, right down the line, or it could be we disagree as to certain aspects. Uh, then we have to decide what we're going to do. Well, we'll definitely write an opinion, but will there be one opinion where we all agree? Or will there be different opinions where there's someone who agrees, but on a different basis, which would be a concurrence, or someone of the three who dissents saying, no, I don't agree. But all you need is for two of the three to agree to the same resolution. So even if there is a majority opinion and a concurrence, which is, I agree with you, but for a different reason, even if there is a dissent, then the same, let's say there's, it's reversal and the concurrence agrees, but for a different reason. As long as you agree for the same uh, ultimate result, which is reversal, then that is the majority opinion. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to decide whether you're going to file a dissenting opinion or not. Um, sometimes you're, you're not sure whether other judges on your court might agree with you and then want to rehear the case in bank, which is what can happen. We circulate our opinions and maybe another judge says, well, you know, I think this dissent by Judge Jordan makes a lot of sense. I think we ought to rehear the case in bank, meaning all the 14 judges will rehear the case and maybe we change the precedent, maybe we change the outcome, uh, anything can happen. Uh, but it's always a matter of conferring. And when we conference after an in-bank hearing uh, or an in-bank uh, court uh, argument, it's always interesting because we have 14 opinions as we go around the room and there can be a number of different opin written opinions that come from that. 
uh, if after argument we think the case is not one where we need a precedential or an important opinion, we'll write a non-precedential opinion. Uh, and the presiding judge will, will appoint the writer of these opinions. And a non-precedential opinion is probably from five to 10 pages with not a lot of analysis. And usually it's a situation where, although we had some questions, we think the district court got it right. And then after we've decided who's going to write the opinions, we need to write them. The whole process can take uh, several months. We have a couple months leading up to the argument. From the time we get the briefs, we might have six weeks up until then. And then after argument and conference, maybe it takes two or three months before the opinions are drafted, circulated to the panel, and then circulated to the full court and the result is issued. Some judges are faster than others in writing opinions. Some judges get to it right away, others not so, so much, but it can, can depend on exactly how much work a, a specific judge has at a certain time. So that's the case for an appellate argument. It's a very interesting process. It can be very complex. It can be very intense. It can be very research oriented. Our law clerks have to research the law, but it's very different from the trial court. And basically the idea that the trial court follows the rules and the law brings about a certain dynamic, but in the court of appeals, the fact that we need to follow the law brings about a dynamic that's even more contemplative and deliberate, and at the same time, a much quieter, uh, situation than we have in the trial court. We don't entertain motions. We don't have lawyers calling us, wanting us to, to uh, decide discovery disputes. We get the briefs, we read them, we think about it, and we write. And that's our job. <coughs> we need to cut out the end there. <coughs> no, it, 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 we, I stopped it at that, so... Um, starting the recording, go ahead whenever you're ready. I just, I, since having choked, I'm a little bit. No worries. <laughs> so in the federal system, we have district courts, which are the trial courts, and there may be one or two or three district courts in a state. For instance, in Pennsylvania, we have the Eastern District, the Middle District, and the Western District, um, whereas Delaware has just one district and New Jersey has one district. So it may vary from district to district. Appeals from those courts go, as I said, to the Court of Appeals. And I am on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and the Virgin Islands. And there are 11 circuit courts, 11 circuits, and then the circuit court for the District of Columbia. And some circuits may have many states. For instance, the Ninth Circuit has a lot of states and there has been great discussion about splitting up the states to make a different circuit because there's a lot of cases that come to the circuit courts from these states. And the circuit courts have to take every appeal that's filed from these district courts. So we can't say, oh, we're gonna hear this, we're not gonna hear that. So I get briefs from, let's say the District of Delaware and from these other districts. Well, a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals gets, gets uh, briefs from all over and it's impossible for them uh, to have, let's say, an and bank, which is all of the judges hear the cases. So their and bank hearings are actually split and it's not by the full court, it's by just the segment of the court because there's so many judges, because there's so many districts. Now, once we decide a case, it will go to the Supreme Court, but not so fast. You have to ask for it to go to the Supreme Court. You have to ask to be granted certiorari. And less than 1% of the cases that ask for cert, we call it cert, are accepted by the Supreme Court. Uh, they may hear 70 cases a year out of the thousands of cases that are, that are filed and that the the cert, grants that are the CERT grants that are requested. They take just a small portion. So our circuit courts end up being the court of last resort for most litigants. Uh, 